Well, I came to Shoreline a few years ago now, but I'll tell you the beginning. I started coming for the clothes closet because I needed some, some items from there. And there was this young lady working there that uh, needed help. So, because she didn't speak Spanish. So I told her I could come and help her, you know, once a week or so. So I started coming. Then she invited me to come to the service. And I said, well, maybe later. But uh, I came the following Sunday with her and, and uh, I liked what I, what I heard. I started coming to service I think it was two times after that that I decided that I would give myself to Jesus because I really felt that that I needed him and I had just found him in my heart and I found what I really needed all these years. And uh, since then, it's it's been seven and a half years. I've been coming and helping in the clothes closet I help in the kitchen on Sundays. I serve because deep inside it makes me happy. It makes me feel worthwhile. It makes me feel like I'm doing something for Jesus, that I'm doing it for his people, for his children, that uh, we are here to help. We are here to welcome everybody that comes and we give our service joyfully here in the kitchen. And uh, after that, you know, I go home, even though I'm tired, I go home happy and I take a nap and it's a happy nap after that. I have served people thinking of what he has done for me. And uh, I just want to give thanks to uh, the people that welcomed me here. Yeah. And then I take a happy nap. Isn't that nice? <laughs> hmm. I want to tell you a little bit more about Lupe Ortiz's story. Uh, because I believe in her story, we see a microcosm. We see a picture of what we're going to learn from God's word today. And that is, what, is it, what does it look like to share God's love naturally? And, and I really think it involves three things. It, it involves loving with our hearts, loving with our hands, and loving with our voices. Our hearts our hands, our voices. And when Lupe came to Shoreline, Lupe had never been in a place where she needed help financially, but she hit a point in life where she did. And when she did, she said, where am I going to go? And she said, I'm going to go to Shoreline Church. Because she had heard that Shoreline was a church that helped people in times of need like that. And we have a women's clothing closet, and a men's clothing closet, and a food pantry, and the list goes on and on of different services that we offer. And so she came, and when she came, Lupe came on this campus, and the first thing she experienced was the heart's of people. They cared about her. They loved her. They listened to her. They didn't just say, here's some clothes, but they, they loved her. They, they, they had compassion and hearts that cared. And that matters. That connects for people. But then she saw something else, that, that these people extended love with their hands. They did something. That, that's what we do. I mean, for us as a congregation, Lupe coming to know Jesus is because we're a church that loves with our hearts, but we love with our hands. And there's lots of different ways we do that. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people at Shoreline serve every single week using their hands to show the love of Jesus. Love with your heart, love with your hands, but there's something added to that. The people that Lupe encountered loved her with their voices. They spoke to her. They prayed for her. Every person who comes to our, our, our food pantries, our clothing closets, our other ministries, we don't force anybody to do anything, but we always say, is there anything we can pray for you for? Well, the situation her life was in, she's like, of course there is. So, so they prayed with her, they prayed for her, they shared their story of Jesus, their love for Jesus. And she actually, Lupe offered to come and help in the women's clothing closet as a part of Shoreline's ministry before she became a Christian. How cool is that? I'll start volunteering before I even know Jesus because this is a way to help people and make a difference in the lives of people. And, 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 and so Lupe experienced hearts that loved, she experienced hands that served, but also voices that prayed for her, people that shared their story, and then some of those people said, hey, you should come to a church service. And she wasn't ready for that right away, but they didn't pressure her, but after a while, she came. And after a couple of weeks, one Sunday morning, she was sitting in the fourth row right on this side, 
And, and I, was, I was preaching, we, I just shared the message of Jesus, that simple story that there's a God who loves us, that we've kind of mixed up our lives and we've wandered from him, but he hasn't stopped loving us and he pursues us. And Jesus came, God came to earth, he died on the cross, he paid the price for our sins, he rose again from the dead, and he offers us not only forgiveness of sins, but he wants to take our hand and walk with us through our whole lives. Lupi sat right there in the fourth row, right about where you're sitting, and she heard that message. So when the service was done, I was talking and praying with people right here as I normally do, and I kind of looked up after people had wandered off, and she was still waiting over there. And I said, are you waiting for me? And she said, yes. So I just walked over there and sat next to her right there, and I said, what, what, what do you need today? And here's what she said. She says, I want to know Jesus. I want to know Jesus. So we sat right there, and we prayed, and Lupe Ortiz became my sister and your sister if you're a follower of Jesus. She became part of the family of God. But here's the beautiful thing. Her story didn't end there. Her story began there. And then Lupe discovered something, that she wanted to share God's love naturally with other people, and she's discovered that means her heart, her hands, and her mouth, her voice, are part of that. So so Lupe's heart began to, to just grow warm for the people she loved and cared about, family members and friends that didn't know Jesus. I've prayed with Lupe many times over the last seven years right here, for people in her, in, her, in her life and her family that don't know Jesus and her heart longs for them to know Jesus. She has compassion for them and wants them to know the Savior. Her heart is engaged. She loves people with her heart, but she also loves with her hands. She's still part of the women's, food, the women's clothing closet. She, she, Lupe will, normal, a normal Sunday, she will be here after all of us left, have left after the third service for an hour to two hours. After the bagels are gone and the donuts are gone, and the, you know, she's cleaning all that up and serving because she wants to use her hands to serve Jesus because that's what you do if you want to share God's love naturally. But Lupe also loves with her voice, with her words. She shared her story today with us. But she talks about her love for Jesus with people because Jesus has changed her life. I hope what you can hear in that one story is this reality that love it is more than just sort of one thing we do. It's, it's our hearts, it's our hands, it's our voices, all captured by the, the heart of God and bringing his truth. And so I want you to think about something. I, I want you to imagine a scenario, because I, I just want us to get a picture in our lives. Sometimes we forget the, the breadth of what love is and how, how, how natural and beautiful it can be, but it takes thought to realize it's a bigger picture than just doing one thing or feeling one thing. So I want you to imagine a young couple, they've been dating for a while, they hit that, they've hit that point in their dating relationship where it's sort of like, okay, we're either going to move forward or we've got to end this thing because it's, you know, we're getting to that more serious point. So they start to have those conversations and they're getting near that should we get engaged kind of point in their relationship. Now I want you to imagine something. Imagine that they're at that point and they're trying to decide where they're going to go forward and he says to her, I need to explain something to you about how I understand love. And so here, here's scenario one. He says to her, I feel love in my heart, very deep inside of me. I, I have a love for you that's very deep inside of me. I feel it. Deeply, but I will never show it, and I will never say it. Somebody said, oh, <laughs> eh, eh, eh. your red light's going, beeper's going, right? How's this going to go? I, I, there's love deep in there, but I'm never going to give voice to it, and I'm never going to do anything to show my love. But you just got to know I feel it deep inside. Is that going to go well? What's the answer? No, it doesn't work that way. Love is bigger than that. Now let's flip it around. Imagine they're sitting there, and they hit that, that decisive point, and she says, I have to tell you something, Okay. She says, I will do loving things. I will do stuff. I'll serve in a loving way. But that's because it's a duty, and I have no feelings for you, (laughs) and I'm not going to speak any words of love to you, but I'll do loving stuff. (laughs) Eh, eh, eh. (laughs) Alarms, bell. This is not going to go well. Love is more, it's big. That's part of it, but it's bigger than that. One more scenario. Back to him this time. Okay, so they hit this deciding point. They're right there, and he says to her, Here's the deal. I will say I love you. Every morning, every night, every afternoon, I will say it. But I don't feel it, and I don't mean it, and I'll never show it. But I'll say it. I'll say the words. How's that going to go? Just as bad, right? All the bells and whistles. and It doesn't work that way. We understand that love is something to the extent that comes from our hearts, but it's also shown in our actions. And it's also affirmed with our words. That's just the way love works. And, and, and so, so here's the thing. What, what helps us, I mean, as we look at a person and say, do they love me? Or as we look and say, am I being loving? What helps us realize that love is authentic? And here's what it is. When the feelings are deep and real, 
when the actions are consistent, when the words are true and they line up with the feelings and the actions. This is powerful. This is life-changing. This is how God used Shoreline Community Church to impact Lupe's life. This is how God is using Lupe to impact other people's lives. And this is how God wants to use you if you're a follower of Jesus to share his love naturally with others. To love with your heart, to love with your hands, to love with your voice and the words you speak. And so what I want to do is I want to learn this lesson deep in our souls from Jesus. Let's look at how Jesus loved with his heart, loved with his hands, and and loved with his words as he spoke words of life to other people. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 9. If you have your, you use your phone or if you use an iPad, just go ahead and pull up Matthew chapter 9 there. And we're going to look at starting verse 35. And we're looking at this issue. How Jesus felt about people who were wandering far from his love and his grace. The heart of Jesus. How did Jesus feel? How was his heart engaged? This is one of my, I mean, I love the whole Bible. It's all God's word. But this is one of my favorite passages. It just, it struck a chord for me years ago. And it's continued to be close to my heart. We have this picture, verse 35 of Matthew 9. Jesus went through all the towns. He went through the villages. He was teaching in their synagogues, their gathering places. He was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Now watch this in verse 36. When he, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus felt his heart engaged with people. He saw them in their wandering. He saw them in their brokenness. And you know, people, people can look so together and so, so like they've got all, you know, they, they got life all together. They can have plenty of money, plenty of security in the world's eyes and still feel empty on the inside. He saw people like sheep wandering, uh, unprotected, in dangerous places without a shepherd. That's the heart of Jesus. He had compassion. When Jesus looked at me, When I was 15, almost 16 years old, wandering and empty, he had compassion on me. When he looked at you, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian, before you knew him, his heart was filled with compassion. He wasn't looking at you with bitterness or anger or judgment. He was looking at you with compassion. If you're here today in the worship center, in the family worship venue online, and and you don't yet know Jesus, you haven't put your faith in Jesus, and you probably have the suspicion that, well, if there's a God out there, he's looking at me, and he's upset with me, and he says all the wrong things I do, and he wants to get me, that's not what the Bible teaches. He has compassion on you. God's, God's reaching out to us begins with his love, his awareness of our need, and his love for us. And we have to understand that, and we should see other people who aren't yet followers of Jesus and have compassion on them. You know what happens with Christians sometimes? We look at people who aren't Christians and we get upset with them for how they live their life. They're they're making bad choices, they're doing bad things, and we kind of push them away, we're upset with them. Don't forget that the Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote the the majority of the books in the New Testament, or more, more books in the New Testament than anybody else, he was murdering Christians before he became a Christian. Not some of you look at it and say, oh, I feel affection for that person if you're a Christian. But people would have been terrified of him, and they were. But, but God looks at us, whatever condition we're in, and he has compassion on us. And we should have compassion on others. Sometimes as, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we get upset with non-Christians because they're not acting like Christians. Did you hear what I just said and how strange that is? We get upset with non-Christians, language they use, things they do, choices. We get upset with non-Christians because they're not acting like Christians. Listen closely. It's hard enough to act like a Christian when you are a Christian. (laughs) Right? And we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's a challenge. Don't expect a non-Christian to act like a Christian. My my brother Jason, before he was a Christian, he just lived in the world, and and I was sharing with him and loving him, and Sherry and I and others were pointing him towards Jesus, but before he was a Christian, man, he didn't care. And that wasn't shocking to me. Well, of course, he doesn't know Jesus. And, and, And so we have to understand that how Jesus felt and how Jesus feels today about those who are wandering far from him, it's love and compassion. And if Jesus had love and compassion of his heart, love people, then how should we respond? How should we feel towards those that don't yet know Jesus? How should we be feeling toward them? And here's the first thing, compassion, just like Jesus. Our hearts should care. 
We should be filled with compassion for those who don't yet know how much God loves them. No matter what they're doing. No, even, you know, the Apostle Paul was killing Christians. I mean, if, if someone's doing worse stuff than that, you know, but, but we can get offended by small things. And people, you know, God still has compassion. We should have his compassion. Clarity. We should, have clear, we should feel clarity that this person is deeply loved by God and Jesus went to the cross for them. That we should have clarity that God loves them so much and understand the way that God understands them. And we should care. We should want the best for them. I think of my dad. Just year after year, I've been praying for my dad for over 40 years now that he would come to know Jesus. I got to watch every one of the kids in my family become Christians and start walking with Jesus, still praying for my dad. But I care about my dad. And I want, I, I just believe his life would be so much more beautiful and so much more rich if he would meet Jesus. I believe that with all my heart and I care about that. So we need to feel like Jesus. But part of the way we love, you know, if we're gonna share God's love naturally, we have to feel for people, we have to love them. But there's more to it than just that. But I want to pause there for a minute. And I want to add, some of you, I'm going to ask, and we're going to pause and pray in just a moment. And some of you are like, okay, the service is over. Like you're putting your shoes back on. And you're like, oh, good. No, just, you can, this time to get another, another mint. Make yourself comfortable. We're not done yet, okay? Um, just getting warmed up here. But, I want to, but when I pause to pray, I, want to ask, I just want to ask you to do something. Would you bow your heads with me and just quiet your hearts for a minute? And I'm going to ask you to raise your hand high and hold it up in the air as I pray if you would say today, that God, I want my heart to love people more. People that don't know. If you, if you just say, I want my heart to love people that are far from Jesus more, raise your hand up in the air. If, that's you, if, you, say, if, I, if you say, God, I want to have more tenderness and more compassion and more care for people, just raise your hand and keep it up in the air there. If you want your heart to be soft towards those who are far from Jesus, Lord Jesus, we're going to pray right now, Lord, and I'm, I'm raising my hand too. Lord Jesus, we want our hearts to be more tender. We want to be filled with more compassion. We don't want to look at someone who's not a Christian and be offended that they don't act the right way. We want to have the love of Jesus with compassionate hearts so God soften our hearts and help us love people more. And if we're growing weary of loving, empower us to love even more. With the love of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you're going to get a chance. And some of you might just be like each time go, that's me, that's me. And I, I just, if that, uh, we start there with the heart. Now, Let's talk about how Jesus treated people who are wandering far from his love and his grace. How did Jesus you know, serve? How were his hands engaged? He was doing things to show love. Not just, not just feeling love, but when you feel love, you do something. And I want to tell a story from the Bible, from, from John chapter 8. And there's this woman uh, who's brought to Jesus. And you have to get the picture. Jesus is in the temple courtyards. And in the temple in Jerusalem, there was the temple, but then there was kind of courtyards where rabbis could teach. In different places, people would sit and rabbis would teach. So here Jesus is. There's a crowd of people. He's teaching and all of a sudden, there's this hubbub, there's this noise, there's this, you know, this crowd starts kind of moving through the courtyard, bringing this woman to Jesus. And they're, not, they're bringing this woman to, to condemn her, but mostly to try to condemn Jesus. So they bring this woman, and they put her in front of him, and they say, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Caught in the act of adultery. And the law says she should be executed. Now, first I want you to notice something. Who didn't they bring to Jesus? Who's missing in this picture? The guy. And if you're caught in the act of adultery, you're not alone. <laughs> we'll leave it at that, but okay. And yet they just bring this woman. And they say, she's caught in the act, and they say the law says she should be executed. Now, here's, what the, here's what's going on. You have to understand what's going on. They don't care about the woman. They care about trying to trick Jesus. And here's what they're thinking. If Jesus says... Well, show her grace and forgiveness. They're going to say, he's a lawbreaker. And if Jesus says, you're right, executor, he's no longer compassionate and loving. This is the proverbial rock at a hard place. And they put, they're trying to put Jesus there. They're going, they're going we got him now. <laughs> we got Jesus now. Because there's nothing, can, no matter what he says, he's in big trouble. And they, all they're trying to do is condemn Jesus. And she's a pawn in their little game. And that's where we pick up the story. In John chapter 8, beginning in verse 6, they were using this question, you know, Rabbi, the law says this, you know, she should be executed. Well, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Again, they're trying to get to Jesus. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, Jesus, what should we do? Should she be judged? What should we do? When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. He said, if you're perfect, you're sinless, you start the execution. 
At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time from the older ones first. Why do you think the older ones left first? Think about it. Yeah, see? (laughs) They've had longer to do wrong things. They're probably a little bit wiser, but they start dropping their stones and walking out of the courtyard. With the older ones left first. With the, uh, the older ones, and only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. She's standing, he's on the ground kind of scrolling, writing with his finger. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Now I want you to watch Jesus' response because two things happen here, all right? He says, then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Grace. Go now and leave your life of sin. Truth. A call to repentance. Do you see this? Here's this woman. And she's been caught in sin. And she's standing before the only one who could throw a rock at her. The only one who was sinless. The only one who had a right to judge her was Jesus. And he said, neither do I condemn you. I offer you grace. But watch this. Now go and leave your life of sin. He speaks the truth to her. And calls her to do what the Bible calls repent. To change. To live in a new way. Do you understand that Jesus, the Gospel of John says again and again, Jesus came with grace and with truth, with grace and with truth. And some Christians want to do this game. Grace, 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 no truth. And that's just license to do whatever you want. Some Christians want to go truth, 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 no grace. And that's judgmentalism and Phariseeism and and condemning people. But Jesus did and calls us to come with grace, neither do I condemn you, and with truth, what you're doing is wrong, go and stop doing it. And he brings those together. And that's life. That's hope. It's both grace and truth. And and, and so Jesus extends grace, but he speaks truth. And so how does he treat her? In this situation, here's the picture. Jesus was the one who could have used his hands to take a stone and throw it at her and judge her. Jesus could have clenched his fists and say, I condemn you. But Jesus says, no, I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to extend you grace. But I'm going to ask you to to become all God wants you to become. And that is to live in righteousness and holiness and change your way of living. That's the hands of Jesus that came to me and to you if you're a Christian and are offered to you if you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ. And so here's the question. How should we treat people who need the grace of Jesus? How should you and I, when we encounter people that don't yet know Jesus, that are are living in ways that are far from Jesus, how should we treat them? We, We know that we should, in our hearts, have compassion and care, but our actions. We should recognize truth breaking sin and remember where we came from. When you recognize sin in somebody else, it's not like you say, okay, if I'm going to show grace, I have to not, you know, not even acknowledge that. Jesus died to pay for sin. He notices it. He just paid the price for it. And, and, and so, and so we, we need to recognize sin, but also we extend amazing grace and forgiveness. And we can do that in a thousand ways. Here at Shoreline, it, it, it's things like the women's clothing closet that Lupe came to, or the men's clothing closet, or the food pantry, or teams that go to retirement centers, or people that serve in our community, what's, what's coming up with, with Love Our Central Coast. There's so many ways to take your hands and say, I'm not just going to love with my heart, I'm going to do something that shows the love of Jesus. And that's the call of Jesus for us. So I'm going to ask you again, if you would just, if you would bow your heads with me and quiet your heart for a minute, and I'm going to ask you again, I want to pray for those who would say this from their heart, they would say, I, if you would say, whether you're a Christian or even not a follower of Jesus yet, you know, Lupe started serving in the, in the women's clothing closet before she was following Jesus. But if you say, I want to take my hands and use them to show God's love and to serve others. Lord, take my hands. If that's your case, just take a hand or one or two and put it in the air and say, God, use my hand. Here's my hand. Here's my hands. And lift the air and say, God, here's my hands. Use me to serve others. If you say, I want to serve more with greater passion I want to serve more faithfully. And just raise your hands. I want to be, make my hands available to serve Jesus. And so Lord Jesus, all around the room, people are raising a hand or hands and just saying, Lord, here's our hands. Let us love with your love from our hearts, but let us love with our hands. Let us serve faithfully and consistently in a way that shows the love of Jesus. Let us put flesh on our hearts and show the love of Jesus with our hands. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. And I want to give you two encouragements before I go on. Uh, 
after the service today out in the courtyard area, we've got two booths today. One is Love Our Central Coast. And you're gonna, this card is in your bulletin, so you've got the website. I went on the website this morning. There's tons of different projects. Some say we still need like 30, 40, 50 people on individual projects. So go online or go to that booth today and just say, hey, I want to get involved. They have some from like 8 till 11 or from 9 to noon. It's just one morning. But if you're able to be, if you're in town, you can do that. Sign up for this and let's go show the hands of Jesus. And also in the courtyard today, there's another booth and it says, be a somebody. And what that means is be somebody who cares about the next generation. We're inviting people to go to that booth and say, I want to learn more about serving our children. Take my hands and let me on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, our children or our middle school kids or our high school kids. It, it, we have hundreds of people involved in serving in our children and youth ministry. And our, the next generation needs examples of people like you who love Jesus and who are seeking to follow after him to serve them in some way. So if you say, I'll serve in children's ministry, I'll learn more about it. Go out there and check that out after the service. So Jesus models for us, loving with the heart, loving with our hands. But here's the third area. How Jesus spoke to people who were wandering far from his love and his grace. That our words matter. And with a heart that loves people that are far from Jesus, with hands that serve people that are far from Jesus, should come words that speak the story and the love and the grace of Jesus to others. And, and if you have your Bibles, look with me at, at, at John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, Jesus encounters this guy named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a religious leader. He is an influencer. He is wealthy. He's a person of power and influence. And he's actually quite, he's actually a leader in, you know, kind, of, kind of in the religious world, but he's still empty on the inside. And the passage actually says in John 3, it says that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. What that actually means is under the cloak of darkness. He came at night so he wouldn't be seen by other people. Because he's a religious leader who is empty on the inside. So he's coming to Jesus and saying, is there more? And Jesus and Nicodemus have this amazing conversation. But here's the one part I want you to notice today. In verse 5, as they're talking, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. He says, Nicodemus, you've been born. You had a mother and you were born physically. Flesh gives birth to flesh. But the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. There's a new birth, a new life that comes spiritually. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. To Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. That's where that comes from. People say, I'm a born again Christian. All it means is that when Nicodemus finally heard Jesus. She said, you need a new life. You've been physically born, but there's a whole new life of spiritual birth. That happens when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And Nicodemus had that rebirth. He became a follower of Jesus Christ. If you read through the Bible, you, you learn this. He, he became a follower of Jesus. But now I want you to think about this for a minute. At this moment, Nicodemus could have been offended and bothered. I'm a, relig I'm a religious leader. I'm a person of influence. And you're telling me I have to be born again. As a matter of fact, he, the conversation goes on. He says, are you telling me I've got to like physically be born by my mom again? And Jesus says, of course that's not what I'm saying. And he's actually the way rabbis would kind of debate. He's going, are you saying this? No, I'm not. And they had this conversation. But Jesus said to him, you have a moment to decide if you want to start a new life spiritually. And we all have those moments. And many here have said yes to Jesus. I had that moment when I was almost 16 years old. And, and for some of you, you've, you've never had that moment. But would your heart be open if Jesus were to say, but Jesus spoke words, you must be born again. And, and that's clear, decisive words of hope and life. So how should we speak? What does it mean if you're a follower of Jesus? How do you speak words? How do you love with your heart, with compassion, love with your hands, with service, but love with your voice and say something? Well, lots of different ways. How should we speak? We should say to people, I care about you and your spiritual condition. I care about where you are spiritually. How are you doing? Where are you at? I had that conversation with my brother Jason many times before he became a Christian. I said, Jason, I want so much for you to know Jesus. I care about where you're going to spend eternity. I love you. I care about you. We can have those conversations with people. How should we speak? We can say to people, you have a real and deep spiritual need. There's, there's a need inside of you. Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, you need to be born again. You need new life. And Nicodemus was feeling it. He was searching. He just couldn't, just couldn't put his finger on the pulse of what it was. But Jesus said, this is what you need. And so we can let people know of their need for Jesus. And then to tell people Jesus is the one who can meet that need. There's new birth. There's new life 
awaiting you. We can put faith into words. We can tell our story and his story and share the difference that Jesus has made in our lives. And it can be natural and organic and just part of the way we live our lives. So I'm going to ask you to pray with me one more time. And I'm asking you to bow your heads and just to quiet your heart. And this is a big one. Uh, This is a big one because you're praying, God, use my voice, use my words. But if you would say this morning, if you would say, if you're a follower of Jesus, God, there's someone in my life that I love and care about that doesn't know you. And I want a fresh boldness and ability to talk about my faith in natural ways. If you say, I want to be able to open my mouth and talk about Jesus a little bit more than I do today, raise your hand. I say, I want to, God, give me boldness. Give me courage. God, I get nervous. I get afraid. Just keep your head high up in the air there. Just say, Lord, I want to be available to tell other people about your love. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that you will give us words to speak that are kind and gracious, but true and honest, that we would be able to share with people that they need to be born again. They need to know Jesus, that we would be able to share compassion and love and grace. So, Lord, use our words. Let us know when it's the right time to be quiet and let us know when it's the right time to speak, but use our words to share your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to share one more thing, and that is, I'm, I'm just, I'm certain, knowing how many people are in this room and in the family worship venue and how many people are online today, there's people that are listening saying, you know what, I, I come to Shoreline or I watch Shoreline online or I, I've been coming for, this is my first Sunday here or I've been coming here for years. But I've never had that moment where I've said, I want to be born again. I want to know Jesus. I want to confess my wrongs and my sins and I want to receive Jesus. And and here's the beauty of of what's called the good news of Jesus, is that God knows all of our problems, all of our struggles, everywhere we've messed up. The Bible calls that sin, but everywhere we've messed up, he knows all about it, and he loves us anyways. And God has given a way to bring us back to himself, and that's through Jesus Christ, entering human history, dying on the cross, taking our sins and our shame and our punishment on himself. And he took all that on himself, and he he, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He gladly received that. And, and he, he said, he, said uh, he, he just spoke and he said, God, I, I cry out for these people. And, and Jesus, Jesus, on the cross when he was dying, he cried out for us. And finally he said, it is finished. It's paid. It's done with Jesus paid the price. And, and you look and say, well, are you saying it's free? To receive Jesus is free. Here's the answer. Absolutely free for you. Why? Because he paid the price. And he took our shame, and he took our punishment. And then he died, and three days later, he rose again. And so today, I want to one more time, just as we close, I want to ask us to bow our heads one more time and to quiet our hearts one more time. And if you're here in the worship center or in the family worship venue, there's going to be a pastor in the front of the family worship venue, or if you're online, you can, go, you can go online and respond, and we've got a pastor waiting to respond to you. But if you're in the worship center right now or in the family worship venue, and you want to pray right now, And say, Jesus, I want to receive you for the first time and become your follower. Do the best I can to receive your grace, take your hand, and walk with you through this life and into eternity. I want to follow Jesus. If that's you, I want to ask you just to raise your hand right now and raise it really high. And when I see your hand, I'm going to actually ask you to look up at me real quick. And so I'm right over here. Look up. Okay, I see your hand right there and in the back right there of this section. Good. And up here in the balcony, right here. If you look up at me right here in the balcony on the left side. Okay, good. Right there. Good. And up at the very super top of the balcony. Okay, you got I see you there. Good. Is there anybody else? Okay, up in the balcony over here also. Got another person there. I'm just looking across up over here. Okay, right above, right, yeah, good, at the very back wall. Good, right there. Anybody else? And it's not, I'm not going to do a long thing. There's no pressure. But if you just say, I want to pray to receive Jesus today for the first time over here on the main floor. Good, right here. Good. Anybody else? Okay, if you just raise your hand, and if I acknowledge you, or if you didn't, I didn't get a chance to, just raise your hand up a little higher one more time, and let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I want to pray for these folks that have their hands up in the air, that this would be the day that they would come into your family and become part of the family of God. And so if, if you are raising your hand right now, and if you're online, if you're in the family worship venue or you're online, would you just in your heart say this prayer to God? Say, dear God, I come before you today, and I acknowledge all my wrongs, and all my brokenness and all my needs to you. And I say, Jesus, thank you for loving me with your heart. Thank you for loving me with your hands. You took nails through your hands. You died on the cross for me. Thank you for loving me with your words and inviting me to be born again. I confess all my wrongs, and I accept you, Jesus Christ. Just tell him I accept you, Jesus Christ, right now. And I want to take your hand and follow you every day of my life and into eternity. 
And for everyone in this room, I just want to close praying, Lord Jesus, for those that, for the 10 people in the first service this morning and all those in this service now and the family worship venue and online who have said yes to you, Jesus, Lord God, we rejoice that you give us a way to heaven, a way to eternity, a way of hope forever, that Jesus, you love us so deeply. Now send us from here loving with our hearts, loving with our hands, and being bold to love with our words, our voices, to tell people the beautiful story of Jesus that has changed our lives forever and ever. We thank you, Jesus, and we praise you. We pray this in your name. Amen. And the Bible says the angels of heaven rejoice. Can we rejoice with God right now? Yeah. Amen.